An excited hello to all newcomers and scholars alike who are eagerly looking to more deeply study the serious issue of whether the U.S. Constitution is actually biblical or not, as I'd like to give an introductory few notes on this debate or trial that you're about to see to lay some groundwork for you upon which I hope it'll greatly help you to understand the nature of the two sides you're about to hear as this mock court proceeding then unfolds before your eyes. Now, before we even begin, please know that the agreement to stage this as a mock trial is already slanting the entire debate concept into a man-created format of examination, not a biblical one, already placing the entire contest in a man-made court type of scenario, even before it begins. It is therefore confined to the dictates of man's more abstract procedures, where wordcraft is law, not documented biblical procedures. This, in and of itself, allows Mr. Winters an upper hand of appearing to be the ideologue of the two men, as if man's due process is the supreme way of establishing right from wrong, not Yahweh's. Where then the viewers, based on every American's lifelong conditionings, will subliminally just expect this trial to go as we normally would expect to see in all of our other man-made trial scenarios that we've witnessed in our lives, which is based on legalese word manipulation rather than solidly based logical facts and documented law. This is why the Constitution was written as vaguely as it was in the first place, my friends, to facilitate any court's need to dance around the actual biblical morals and facts that do not benefit the elite and ruling class. So even before this debate even begins, therefore, we are already off to a bad start with an imaginary common-law word artist's canvas being the basis for Mr. Winder's defense, while the more humble and accommodating Ted Wyland is then expected to also submit to the emotionally focused allegories of a legally trained lawyer who is, yes, expert at masterfully arranging unwritten abstract laws to appear as if they are somehow cast in stone and assumed valid to the uneducated bystander. To then enter this makeshift courtroom, hoping to help both sides to be equally equipped, I would then like to better fight fire with fire, as it were, where I would then like to take an equally fair license to set a better stage in also escaping from pure facts, if just for a moment, and ask you, the viewer, to enter the realm of the imagination with me for a few minutes allowing your mind to momentarily drift into a surrealistic perspective of their world of utopian laws. Because to be fair here, their so-called laws are not even laws at all, but unwritten theory of law, based on unfounded and unwritten hypotheticals of morals and law. We are then ourselves then, in this prefacing message here, merely using their own routine tug into imagination land, to our own benefit for a change, in showing how their arguments in legalese are all based on a lack of facts and logic when convenient for the courts or its agents. So we too will delve into this tactic only to also help balance this disagreement in that light. So yes, for about nine minutes here, we'll enter the realm of colorful illustration, just as the legalese experts are so well versed in doing making sure that this is being done especially for the newbies among us who are just getting their feet wet in such law basics, where this video was produced five or six years ago and is called The Land of Make-Believe Laws. There are only two types of governments for mankind. There's either the Creator's system of rules or Satan's many various forms of rules that disagree with the Father's laws or that would be called anti-rules if you really wanted to put them in a category, I guess, but there's no in-between rule system for those who, even in the least, believe in the God of the Bible. There's either the law system of the Father, which are the simple Ten Commandments and the biblical statutes and judgments that fall underneath their respective categories, or there is the law system of Satan, which is simply described by the Satanists as falling under one simple rule, do what thou wilt, is the whole of the law. 
which means, in essence, to do whatever you want, so long as you don't follow the Father's rules. Or it might be like Satan saying, if you follow me, you can do anything you want to, and I won't chase you, so long as you do whatever you want. Because I like doing whatever I want, too. So, there's either the Father's rules or Satan's. Or, again, you either obey the Father or you don't. It's pretty simple. Any rule system that has to deviate from the Father's is automatically something that somehow has to deviate from the Father's. <laughs> Therefore, there's either the God of the Bible who said, Obey me, or Satan who says, Disobey that guy. So there's only two deities, two systems of law. If you're not following the Father's law, you're following the other deities' law system, which then makes them both theocracies. There's only two forms of governments. They're both theocracies. So when somebody says, oh, following the Bible, that's a theocracy, don't let them scare you. You're either obeying the Father in heaven or you're disobeying the Father. So, But man has forever dreamed of having his cake and eat it too, right? So where he's never ceased trying to invent new law systems for himself that would be accommodating or at least exceptionally lenient in his own particular sin of choice, right? Especially the more with folks who have lots of sins, of choices in their blackened hearts to to hope to hold on to. You see, the Bible is a very well-orchestrated system of law that fits in perfectly with a wholesome lifestyle that was created for and hoped to be chosen by him that designed us all. But those who are not happy with such clean lifestyles were more prone to try and rearrange things, to try and get the law systems to work in their favor. And since you can't just write a law system that says, disobey God, and expect people to come, it's not going to happen because your sin of choice might not be the other person's sin of choice. In other words, if you like to murder people and other people don't like to do that, very few people are going to come to your system of law and your kingdom. So you're going to have a minority of people, and which means you won't be able to defend yourself because you'll be a minority. If you choose a law that says, I like to be a pedophile, of course, again, you're in a, a minority category. So if you choose a group of them, then of course, you have to write them all down and then of course, then you have to worry about all the other people in your system doing those things against you, like thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder. You know, you have to worry about them doing it against you if it's lawful to do such. The only way to achieve getting another government opposed to the fathers without actually writing it down so that then you could protect yourself in the meantime against the peasantry who would want to do those things to you, then you have to write them in vague ways using dual language systems, or legalese as we would call it today, or something even simpler, as they've done over the years, a very unwritten or an unspoken law system. Make it sound so nice on the surface that people just want to fall for it because it sounds nice. And of course, you haven't educated these people, and you're talking about peasantry who have grown up away from the law system education intentionally because you don't want them to know these things. So to pull them away from their education and to pull them into a system that sounds better is what usually happens. Well, anyway, <clears throat> having said all that, let's use an imaginary way of taking people back to the reality of what's going on today. So here you go. Let's imagine ourselves centuries ago. And we're in a system that's falling apart. It's, it's falling away from the Father's law system. It's get, becoming chaotic because people are leaning into their sins of choice. And it's, it's getting uncomfortable. It's turning into an oppressive regime. So you, you're off, your bag's packed, you're heading for parts unknown, you don't know where you're going, and you're walking across continent after continent, and you finally see a kingdom ahead of you. It looks like a great palace. What a wonderful looking place to live. Now, oh, it looks like it's hard to get to, though. But that's a good thing, because it means who can invade them? And so you, you hunt around, you go from hillside to hillside, trying to find a way to get to this big mountain kingdom on the top of the hill, and you finally find a trail. So you run up this trail, and you get there, huh? Wow! I better be careful, though. Scope the place out a little bit. All right. What's this all about? Who lives here? What are these people all about? Well, it can't be too bad because they've built a really nice palace. And then, oh, you see a sign. What's it say? Common law? Common law? And there's nothing written down? I don't have rules to follow? How wonderful. It says I have to follow these rules, but they're not written down. Wow! How could you ask for anything better? Utopia! Wow! So what do you do? You run off looking for the gate. 
you find a couple guys that look pretty friendly at first, and oh, well, maybe they're not real friendly. Well, okay, so they have to be a little mean looking because they don't want intruders, right? You're going to want somebody mean looking to protect the gates of your kingdom. So, okay, that works, all right. So you go up to them and you say, hey, how do I get in? How do I become a member of your kingdom? It sounds so good. Unwritten common law rules. It sounds so wonderful. And the guy at the gate says, well, you have to pay a hefty fee to get inside, though, because it's a, we're a strict system. We keep intruders out, and we keep it very peaceful and loving inside. Well, that sounds so good. All right, let me in, and we'll work out the deal when I get inside. How's that sound? Okay, so they let you in. You get inside, and the door slams behind you. Uh-oh. Now you're in. Now soldiers come up to you and approach you. Oh, you're new in town. Oh, you have to pay the, the entrance fee. So, of course, then you have to dig deep in your, your change pocket and pull out all the gold and silver coins that you need to pay these guys. They then set you up with a job and tell you where to go and you set you up with new people to meet. At first, it sounds great. It looks wonderful. Until you start finding out that these unwritten laws were written to be unwritten so that only the king could tell you what to do whenever he feels like it. Because why? Well, there's unwritten rules. It's whatever he, the king and his friends feel that should be a rule that day. So eventually, you find out you're in a slave state that was worse than the one you left. Well, one of the rules is, if you want to leave the kingdom, you have to pay ten times what you had when you came in. Which, of course, is basically impossible, because they don't allow you to make any money while you're there. You barely get a, a potato and some soup every day to live on. So, this is one example. There's lots more out there like it. When people are confronting you with common law or natural law, unspoken laws, uh, or unwritten laws, and you can look all this up. There's an article on our website that have a lot of these documented laws from Black's Law Dictionary, from Webster's and um, Blackstone's and, and what have you, explaining that, yes, there are a lot of unwritten laws throughout history that, was, that were written in vague ways, even claiming to be unwritten to do that very thing, so that then only those at the elite positions of power and their judges below them in their courts know which way to make all the court decisions sway to benefit the system and not the peasantry. So don't be sucked into these things. Be real careful. The father wrote all his down. In fact, he cast his commandments in stone as an example for us out of love. Those Ten Commandments were given to us, cast in stone. It's his law of love, cast in stone to show us. They need to be written down because man has a tendency to want to deviate from them. The Father says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I and the Father are one. His system of law is there out of his love for us so he can protect us, as a good king and a true Lord would do. It's up to us. Thanks for joining us. Hope this helps. Blessings to you all. I would also like to say that, although Ted Wyland is exceptionally polite and friendly with Mr. Winters in the following main features discussions, giving Mr. Winters the benefit of the doubt in the intention department, and thereby allowed to be seen as maybe just another brother in Christ who is perhaps being distracted by peer pressure, etc. I will not be so ecumenically forgiving and willing to treat him as a brother in Yahweh's kingdom in my own mind's preface here. That's partially because I had read a book given me by one of my own listeners about four or five years back called, quote, The Excellence of the Common Law, unquote, written by, yes, our guest, Brent Winters and had only needed to skim through that exhausting 957-page book with a rough-tooth comb for about two hours to realize that it was all just a very seductively written tap dance routine of utopian-garnished common law legalese. And I didn't misspeak there. I actually meant exhausting, not exhaustive, by the way as that was precisely the impression I got of the overall purpose of his extremely long, drawn-out book that, just as his style of sidestepping the issue can easily be seen here in the upcoming debate, also never anywhere in that book had addressed the issues of the facts and the, conspicuous by its absence, actual missing language of any support of scripture for his baseless praise of the ever-elusive reality of common law. He cannot compare the two especially when one is <clears throat> simply not written down anywhere. 
There's no document to compare. In this trial, you will also hear Mr. Winters refer to the Savior's way, as if it is not a system of hard laid down triune laws, statutes, and judgments ordained by the Heavenly Father. But he adjusts the wording so that the word way sounds more like a happy land, merry kind of a footpath of what he also calls process, which is yet just another way of endlessly talking you around the barn and hoping to avoid the barn's real door of entrance and deeper internal understanding. And just as the psalmist wrote, I hate every false way, I myself want nothing more but to find ways to bring all men into unity in these times, you bet, but not at the cost of disobedience to Father's Scripture. I'm first a man of peace, but again, not at the cost of unfaithfully compromising my loyalties to Yahweh with the artificial piece of abstractly rearranged moralities like common law, natural law, anarchy, political correctness, and countless other false ways that aim to use all of the aforementioned tactics and more. And even if just because all such defilements of true law almost always inevitably do nothing but steer the unsaved researcher over to a cleverly disguised but morally corrupt side of that otherwise biblical unity fence. I also want the audience to understand that I myself hold no personal animosities towards Mr. Winters himself, as he himself may not see the dangers that his soul is in. But I empathetically place his personhood aside and focus with my heart seeking to bring all men into a perfect harmony under Yahweh's literal triune moral ways of righteousness, not a man-written constitution. My negativity is therefore directed only towards the false ways that he and many like him are, and purposefully or not, also helping to send innocently curious men to an imaginary world of laws that, when the masks are all pulled away, all such law systems are an absolutely antithetical contradiction to the perfect law of liberty under Yahweh's design. I therefore give Ted some real credit for his ability to remain calm, polite, and ever patient in this entire three-hour debate, and struggling to hopefully get Mr. Winters on track with their own agreed-to topic matter, where Ted is perhaps being cautiously diplomatic in his own long-range hopes and strategies, where in contrast here, I may sound a little harsh. Yet, without apologies, I find it difficult to be as respectfully friendly to such men who so comfortably boast of their ties as literal agents of Caesar's bar, and who are, and again purposefully or not, so metonymously defending their gold-laying goose oppressive wordcraft court system and its false way. In all fairness and speaking my own conscience, however, I find it hard to believe that men like Mr. Winters do not honestly know that they are acting in such clear adversarial defiance against the lordship and sovereign authority of my perfect king of kings. Otherwise, why would such men have been accepted into the admiralty-based, read Vatican spearheaded, bar association in the first place, I would ask. But now watch the debate yourself and see if you can now catch all the sidestepping moves that we have now forewarned you about and see if you can see how they're endlessly set up as straw men and wooden decoys to avoid the trial's actual agreed-upon examination purpose, which was, and I quote, is the U.S. Constitution biblically compatible, unquote. I hope you will all be blessed by a greater understanding of what truly lies on both sides of this issue. In Yahweh's laws of love that was cast in stone for our own protection, I bid you all his blessings as you watch this.